Well, good morning, everyone. It is a blessing to be here. Seventh day Adventists, from their inception, from the very beginning, have defended as a manifestation of the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts the ministry of Alan Gould White. The story that I told really was about Alan Gould Harmon because she was still single then. Adventists have done this on the, their understanding of Scripture and what they believe that it teaches. And what I want to do today is to give a very brief outline of how they arrived at those conclusions, followed by a look at whether prophets wanted to be prophets and what was the centre of their message. So, let's do some quick going through of some biblical evidences. The first place, perhaps, that they looked was to note that the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts, as found in Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12, and we could name several other places, showed that the purpose of spiritual gifts was to build up the church and to enhance its growth. And in Ephesians 4, verse 12, the purpose is given as to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the purpose of spiritual gifts was to build up the church. And they argued, consequently, that nowhere does the New Testament state that that process of growth or maturity would be completed before the return of Jesus. And so as a consequence, all spiritual gifts were going to continue in the church right through until the second coming of Jesus. They also pointed to Acts 2 and verse 16. And like I said, this is going to be quick because... And I could spend a whole lot, you know, we could do a whole sermon just on those, but we, I don't have the time because of what I want to do. They pointed to Peter's sermon in Acts 2, 16 through 21, where he quoted the Apostle Joel, the Apostle, the Prophet Joel, I need to correct myself, the Prophet Joel from the Old Testament. And in verse 17, Joel wrote, in the last days, this is Acts 2, verse 17, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So they argued consequently that this was only a part fulfilment of Joel's prophecy it was going to happen again at the end. So expect last day manifestations of prophecy and visions. So you can see what they're actually doing is they're saying, hey, we think that there is a biblical basis and a biblical reason to expect all the spiritual gifts in the church, including the gift of prophecy, and ultimately they wanted to say that there was a biblical basis for the ministry of Ellen Gould White. The next thing they did was to argue that in the Old Testament, and here is the story of King Jehoshaphat. Isn't that a great name? You ever met anybody with that name? Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was at the head of the armies of Judah and he, in chapter 20 and verse 20, said to the people, Hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this is the part that 
we've tended to emphasize this next bit. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you shall succeed. So obey the counsel of God's messengers because when you don't obey the counsel of God's messengers, you end up in trouble. And the example of Israel and Judah is a really good example of what happens when you don't follow through and obey their counsel. And then they went to the last book of the Bible, and I'm obviously doing this rather quickly. In Revelation 19, they, they looked here in verse 10 and they said, well, you know, the testimony of Jesus here is the spirit of prophecy. That's what the, the angel said to John. Don't worship me. You know, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, so worship God. And they had already linked that with Revelation 12, 17, indicating that the testimony of Jesus would be a characteristic of God's people at the end. And so they said, expect to find that gift in God's end time church and also expect that Satan and the powers of evil will attack God's people and anyone who believes in the gift. So there in brief, very much in brief, is an outline of how they grounded their belief that Ellen White's gift was a manifestation, notice I did not say the, a manifestation of the gift of prophecy. So let me ask you at this point a question. Did Ellen desire the gift? Do you know of any prophet in biblical times who said, Pick me, Lord, I want to be a prophet. Well, I don't. And Alan most certainly did not go looking for the gift. Prophets, historically, are notoriously unwelcome individuals. Because they usually bring messages that people don't want to hear... And those messages are often messages of rebuke, rebuking certain behaviours and maybe even persons. And sometimes even the messengers themselves don't like the message that they've been given to pass along. You know, for example, um, Jonah, he got a message to give and what did he do? He ran away. God said, go this way. He said, thank you, Lord, and I'm going this way. And away he went. So Jonah did not want to be a prophet. Moses didn't want to go to Pharaoh either. He said, Lord, you know, I've been out of the, uh, the kingdom of Egypt for so many years that I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. And as someone said, has said once for a man who was slow of speech and slow of tongue, he had an awful lot to say. He said, who am I? So he had, he had a self-depreciating attitude. Jeremiah, too, did not want to speak. And uh, he even, even though he is told, and you can find this in the first chapter of the book of Jeremiah, that God had chosen him before he was born, his reaction to being chosen was, Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. And God responds to that very strongly. God says to him, do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. You know, so prophets got chosen. And Jeremiah clearly didn't like the message that he had to bring because he said in chapter 20, 
If I say I will not mention him, you know, I'm not going to talk about God anymore or speak in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary of holding it in and I cannot. So I would suggest to you that it was actually notoriously hard to be a messenger from the Lord and to bear a message from the Lord. Especially when you read the Old Testament, you know, and often the message was full of doom and gloom. Disaster is coming because of your sins. So being a prophet is not an occupation that someone is going to choose. It's not something you're going to put your hand up for because with it comes rejection and even abuse. So Alan Harmon did not set out to be the messenger of the Lord. It was not a position that she coveted or chose. Instead, God chose her. Now, the circumstances of her first vision were not at all remarkable. She, like other Millerites, were rather bewildered and confused when Jesus did not come in 1844. And I want to emphasise something here, that that was where the disappointment lay. And, you know, maybe I'm a little bit dull, but I didn't really drop to that until a few years ago, that the real disappointment wasn't that the prophecy wasn't fulfilled, it was Jesus did not come. That was the disappointment. Jesus did not come. And so they're spiritually confused because what they so fervently expected did not happen. They were suffering a spiritual crisis. She was at the house of Elizabeth Haynes in December of 1844, incidentally to give her mother some respite, because you may remember that she was, she'd had that accident and she had bad health. So she was there, so mum was having some respite from having to, to do all her cares. And while she was there, there was one morning, sometime in December 1844, most likely before Christmas, but we actually have no idea exactly when it was. It was just in that month. And she recalls that while praying, the power of God came upon me as I never had felt it before. I was surrounded with light and was rising higher and higher from the earth. And as this happens... She looks and sees the Advent people travelling on a path that is high up above the world and a bright light is set at the beginning of the path and shines all along the path and that bright light, the angel told her, was the midnight cry. Now I went over this in class, one of my classes only just before the mid-semester break and I got to the statement midnight cry and I stopped and said to them, now do you know what the midnight cry is? And one of them said, someone crying at midnight. <laughs> See, we, we need to, uh, to have our people understand what do those things mean. So the midnight cry essentially was the notion that God had been with them in their preaching and in their message, even though they had things wrong. There's a theological problem there if I haven't seen one. But the notion was clearly that God was with them in their experience and consequently this meant that their experience was legitimate despite their wrong, their wrong setting of dates for Jesus to return. So even though they had that element clearly wrong, God was with them and God was leading them. And this vision of hers indicated, and there's an artist's impression, this artist's impression shows 
Jesus as the central feature of the vision. And I like that. I think that's important. But it showed that this was not the end of the journey, but rather near the beginning of the journey. Now, of course, because she's there with, there were five women, and when she comes out of the vision, they're going, hey, what happened? And so she tells them what she has seen. And of course, do you think the story stayed there, what had happened? Of course not. Okay, there were five women there. So the story began to spread that this is what had happened to this young woman. And those ladies present believed that it was a message from God. And so the word spread and others wanted to hear it. But she didn't really want to tell anybody about what she'd seen. A week later, she has the same vision along with a command. Make known to others what I have revealed to you. But there were several issues. Ellen, first of all, feared that there would be a negative reaction from the Millerite community because she already knew that there were those in the Millerite community who were negative towards anyone who claimed to have visions. And Joshua Himes reckoned that things were really bad up in that New England, Massachusetts area because he said there were five at least up there claiming to have visions. So she knew that the Millerites were negative towards anyone claiming to have had a vision so she drew back from sharing I don't guess that should be a surprise besides she and her family were poor and she would rather have not sure how I did this but anyways she was a sickly girl of 17 women were expected to be in the home that was the societal expectation ladies that's the role of the lady the woman was to be at home Go and God tells her, go and share this message. She's 17, she's weak, she's poor. How is she going to get around to do that? So she has, sees all these things that are against her. And because she had tuberculosis, she coveted death from tuberculosis rather than carry the message. And because she didn't want to share it, it seemed as though God had turned his face from her. And as a result of that, there came upon her a sense of spiritual darkness and despair. And she says, I was afraid. I had grieved the spirit of the Lord from me forever. So she was not in a good way spiritually. But there was a meeting in her family home. There were several of them act happening actually and they, those people coming were praying for her because they were aware that there was a spiritual battle going on. And she came down to one of these and she says, while praying, the thick darkness that had enveloped me was scattered. A bright light like a ball of fire came toward me, and as it fell upon me, my strength was taken away. I seemed to be in the presence of Jesus and the angels. Again it was repeated, make known to others what I have revealed to you. And so... She chose to do so. One of the reasons that she had held back was she was afraid of self-exaltation. You know, God's talking to me, therefore you take notice of what I say. So she was afraid of that becoming a problem. The message she was given was, if that becomes a danger, you will get sick. And given that she had ill health at various times in her life, perhaps it did become a danger at times. So she made a full commitment then to share what God had shown and would show her. Now, at this point, it's important to remember some things about her. And Roger Kuhn, I came across this, Roger Kuhn made this statement a number of years ago. He said, note that this first vision was given to a 17-year-old Sunday-keeping pork eater. 
Okay? So when you read some of that early stuff, just remember what she was. And don't project what she became to that, those early years. It said nothing, he goes on, about either the right day on which Christians should worship or the desirability of a vegetarian diet. And I thought, hmm, I need to share that. What was central then to Ellen White's ministry and how and where did that focus originate? Hmm. There are many things that Adventists have claimed as being important to her and the focus of her ministry. And the times she has been used as a theological club with which to beat others into submission, unfortunately. And that's happened particularly in the heat of argument. At other times, her writings have been used as a source of rules and regulations on what Adventists should or should not do. But what would she want us to see as being the central focus of her ministry? And where did she see that the emphasis lay? And to do that, let me tell you about the third stage of her conversion process. And notice I said the third stage. Um, and I'll try and skip through some of this rather fast. In stage one, it's a deathbed confession after her accident where she simply accepted Jesus as a saviour. Stage two is at a Methodist camp meeting, the only one we know of that she attended at Buxton in Maine. But she had, unfortunately, or fortunately, she'd read books on saintly girls who lived perfect lives. Church libraries are really good resources. Just be careful what you got in them. <laughs> And one of these books was titled Ellen. Ouch. Now, she thought that, well, you know, that's what little girls who loved God could live like. But she went to this camp meeting and she went forward after a sermon on Queen Esther, thinking, well, if I perish, I perish. In other words, you know, God if I come to God, he's either going to accept me or not. And she went forward. The other problem was she had the problem of the Methodist notion of the second blessing. And that basically was the idea that a believer should experience a second blessing of entire sanctification. It would be instantaneous... And the result would be that the believer would receive holiness of heart, perfect love and complete victory over sin. Period. Full stop from that point on. Which, of course, isn't true. She didn't have that experience. And added to that was she saw God as a tyrant who delighted in the agonies of the condemned because she believed in an eternally burning hell. So she still had lots of things to straighten out. So as a result, she had a burden of soul, spiritual darkness, which she kept to herself. Not a good thing. But then she has two dreams. So this is now stage three. Two dreams, both of which happened before her prophetic call. The first dream is what I would effectively call a nightmare. Let me tell you what it was. In this first dream, she dreamed of seeing a temple to which many people were flocking. Only those people who took refuge in that temple would be saved when time should cease. And all who remained outside would be forever lost. Being a shy, retiring type of person, she held back while others kept going forward because she was afraid of ridicule and she wanted other people, you know, to be less people around. Now, this vast temple was supported by an immense pillar and tied to that pillar was a lamb mangled and bleeding because, of course, the lamb represented Jesus. And all who entered the temple, 
they came, they confessed their sins, and that caused them then to rejoice and join those who are singing and rejoicing and being happy. Now, she begins to slowly move forward in spite of her fear when suddenly the trumpet sounds, everything goes black in her dream, the, the, the righteous have shouts of triumph, and she says, I was alone in the horror of night. I awoke in agony of mind and could hardly convince myself I had been dreaming. Now you know why I call it a nightmare. And I suppose it illustrates the point that you can't have faith until you've got nothing left. Until you are going to fully rely on God. Frog. Fully rely on God. Her second dream has her sitting on her, sitting with her head in her hands, apparently in abject despair. When a being of beautiful countenance comes and says to her, Would you like to see Jesus? I mean, what a question. <laughs> Would you like to see Jesus? He's here. You can see him if you desire. Now pick up everything you have, this angelic being said, and follow me. So she picks up her stuff and follows this angel up a set of rickety stairs, looking up, not down, as she goes. And when she gets to the top, there's the landing, and the angel says, leave your stuff there. She does, opens the door, goes inside the door, and there is Jesus. And she says there was no mistaking that face. She knew who it was. And she says, I knew at once that he was acquainted with every circumstance of my life. He knew what was happening in my life. And she tells in this dream that she just collapses because she is overwhelmed. And Jesus comes to her and puts his hand on her head ever so gently and says to her, fear not. Don't be afraid. And she was just overwhelmed with joy and sank at his feet. And when she comes to, in her dream, the eyes of Jesus are still lovingly looking at her. His presence filled me with a holy reverence, she says, and an inexpressible love. This is her second dream. And this transforms her view of God. It changes completely her view of God. My views of the Father, she says, were changed. I now looked upon him as a kind and tender parent rather than a stern tyrant compelling men toward obedience. And so Jesus becomes her focus. Jesus becomes central in her life from that point on. And because Jesus was her focus, Scripture becomes her other major focus. So there's two of them. Because Scripture is where we learn about Jesus. And those two things become the central features of her ministry. And they last throughout her ministry. And we see that, and I'm going to skip across these quotes to jump to these two pictures that I want you to see. This one was commissioned in the 1870s 
And this is the way of life from paradise lost to paradise restored. James White, we used to say, and I've found out differently, we used to say that this is how James saw things. James actually saw problems with that picture. And he commissioned before he died a new one, which Ellen had done. And this is it. Christ, the way of life. Note the difference. Big difference, yeah? Jesus is central. Jesus is what matters. Jesus is where her emphasis was throughout her ministry. And if we are going to be true to her emphasis and message, we will also emphasise Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for Jesus our Saviour. And Lord, may we learn from our forebears and put you at the centre. May we look to you, follow you, and learn from those that have gone before rather than forgetting them. So be with us and bless us in the worthy name of our Saviour Jesus, we pray. Amen.